Welcome back to So Bad It's Good, presented by Betches Media. Uh, one of my favorite parts of this job is being able to point you in a direction of something that you need to view, something that you need to see. And there was a documentary that I got to watch this week that kind of blew me away for so many different reasons. This documentary has so many things in it. Uh, there's, there's romance, there's mystery, uh, there is learning about something that I had no idea about, like facilitated communication. It is this uh, really interesting story that uh, explores the story of Anna Stubblefield, who is a university professor who became embroiled in a controversial affair with Derek Johnson, who is a nonverbal man with cerebral palsy. Um, Anna says she unlocked Derek's mind from his body by teaching him to communicate using a keyboard. But the relationship that followed would lead to a criminal trial that would challenge our perceptions of disability and the nature of consent. Uh, this is such an amazing documentary and how the director presents this story as well. There is so much compassion in the interviews with every character in this story. So without further ado, I would like to welcome the director, Nick August Perna. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Good to be here. Uh, Nick, I th this really was such a challenging story to watch because there were about three different times in viewing it that I was shocked. I was, I was, I was surprised at where the story, um, story went. And I want to uh, really specify to the audience, you did not sensationalize this at all. You presented a story in a very fair manner. Um, how were you first familiar with this story? What made you want to actually document this story? Yeah. Um, so there, there was a, a pretty incredible article that was written in 2015, right uh, at the end of her trial. Um, and it was in New York Times Magazine. And um, I grew up with an, uh, an uncle who had um, a, a lot of sort of, I would say, undiagnosed disabilities, including intellectual disabilities. Uh, I was very close with him. He's since passed actually from COVID. But at the time, um, I was immediately taken by the story. I, I wrote uh, all the characters. I wrote Anna was still in the county jail. She was waiting for sentencing. She had been found guilty. She was facing up to 40 years in prison at the time that I wrote her. Um, the only contact we could have was through written letters. So I wrote, I heard back from her mother who sort of opened up communication between us. Uh, simultaneously, I met with the Johnsons in New Jersey where they live. And everybody expressed an openness um, to, to, talk, to talking more about it. There was no like immediate, immediate yeses. It's obviously, it's an incredibly sensitive story. Um, and the, the sentencing was just about to happen. So it was a very tense time for everybody. But over the course of, I would say, the next two years, Anna was sentenced, by the way, to 12 years initially. But over the course of the next two years, I just I met with everybody several times. I met with Anna in prison when she was in um, she was out in a, a state prison in New Jersey. I met with the Johnson several more times. I didn't bring a camera along. I took my time to build trust with everybody. I, I'm not I don't come. My background is not it doesn't come from a kind of a gotcha journalism where I, you know, I wanted to exploit or sensationalize the story. It came from a very personal place of curiosity um, about all their experiences, about the mystery of what experience Derek had and the kind of endless questions I had about that uh, as it related, not just to him, but my own questions about, uh, about my uncle and you know, were there moments that I missed in his life, right? Growing up, were there were there things that was there was there intellect, was there memory, was there experience, was there emotion that we missed as a family? I had feeling I was struggling with my own feelings of guilt about that. There's so much hope and promise to this method of facilitated communication, which is the kind of um, almost <sighs> potentially dangerous power of it, right? is it provides an incredible amount of hope and intrigue about, um, in some cases, what has been a mystery for decades for many families about what might be going on, on inside a person's head, right? Are, yeah. they locked, are they locked in, right? Which is everybody's worst nightmare, right? Is like to be locked into your body 
for decades. I, it's, it's an inconceivable experience. So the stakes were so high to this case, and I thought it merited uh, a film that really brought the audience in to the experience of going on that journey of trying to understand what was there, was there something there, and, and of course, the question of was this a love story or was this a story of abuse in the end? I know. Um, uh, and all the how do you of that, all the ethical yeah questions and uh, that that presents to people. As a documentarian, though, how do you throughout the process, throughout this entire process, even into editing, how do you stay objective? I mean, did you at the very end have a take on this? Like because you present it so beautifully, is that you really? It really is in the eye of the beholder where we're at with this story, but it is interesting also how you say, like, I put my own hopes and dreams onto Derek. I'm like, oh my God, what if he is this genius? What if he is this person that like has like these really brilliant thoughts about life and race and love and all of the, like, we want that for him. And then it's so even interesting. You have this uh, interview with the brother at the end, like, you know, cause he's like, well, I'm from this collegiate background. I thought, yeah, that's, I mean, maybe just like, this is part of the family. And then he almost has to accept, but maybe he's just Derek, you know, maybe he's just a guy that I grew up with that I love dearly, but he's not uh, potentially even on my level in terms of a, a scholar level. Uh, I mean, where did you wind up? Are you even allowed to share that? I mean, how do you keep your mind blank? I mean, listen, I think that the, the, what's interesting to me about the film and what kept me so passionate about it over the course of you know six or seven years in the making was that every time I kind of came to um, uh, a conclusion is maybe too strong a word, but th th there were there were like 20 new questions that were unlocked from that conclusion, right? And so I was I was driven forward by a kind of pursuit of a reality that was very, um, elusive and was always changing and it was changing according to the kind of ethical framework of what I was bringing to each new question, which is to say, as I learned about facilitated communication, as I learned about some of its flaws, um, but then I would talk to people who had, who had seen it work. Um, and then even beyond the science, there's the question of, what did he actually experience? And to kind of, when you draw a conclusion with a story that's this complicated, you risk closing doors on, I think, illuminating parts of the human experience that that are, are still relevant, right? So no matter how you come down in terms of what you conclude about the story, there are things that I think the average audience has not thought about before. And I think that there's experiences there that are both very personal to Derek, but also very universal about what does it mean? Uh, what is self-determination really, right? Who who gets to have romantic and sexual love and who doesn't? Who decides those things? Should they decide those things? How do we protect people um, that are vulnerable without overprotecting them, right? Uh, at what point does something become abuse and do the intentions matter if the intentions are initially good um and that that you know that becomes that brings you into questions of the ethics of, of of sort of guilt and the trial and so it's like all i wanted to make a film that you know there's a famous um frame at the end of one of my favorite films 400 blows which is a still frame at the very end right where he's running on the beach antoine duanel after this whole very difficult experience with his own family and it's this moment of kind of freedom and 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 it freezes on him and the last frame is kind of you can't it, it almost he looks sad or confused right and it's like the story continues all the way to that last frame and i made a decision early on that i really wanted to do the same thing with this i wanted the audience to be to be questioning and thinking and pondering the story until the last text card until the last music cue and the last credit, right? And um, and I, I really hope that I, I've achieved that. So the, the question of where I landed, I think is 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 um, almost one for an entirely other other interview. And I'm not trying to avoid it. I have my- No, no, yeah. But I really believe that the questions are more important than the conclusions in this case, because there are questions people have never asked themselves before. Yeah, Nick, I'm still pondering it. I haven't been able to shake this all week and I keep 
going back because every time I think I come to some conclusion, something else will remind me of even, uh, and I'll explain what facilitated communication is to the audience before we start this interview or before they hear it. But, you know, there's the teacher's assistant that took notes uh, based on Derek's, you know, for the paper. And, and she didn't know anything about the book. She just helped him take the notes. So you have that person saying, I had no communication with Anna in terms of what to write. So you would also have to say Anna's almost writing her own love story in a sense. And there is uh, an interview with an expert that she's he's like, I can't say that she did this. I can't like the human mind is so interesting that potentially there was this split or maybe she was wanting something in her relationship she wasn't getting. And this is such an interesting love story. If you look at it from that angle, do we write these things in our minds for what we want or what a love story can be? So there's this strong element of me really wanting to believe Anna. But then you have these talking heads with the mom where you can sense the anger, the fury, the quiet fury of like, that is my boy. That is my boy. Or when the brother will get a little choked up in talking about the experience and you can't discount that at all. Like that brings you right back into there. It is so emotionally upheaved. Like, I mean, it just every, every angle you get an emotional wallop out of this thing. And I, I for once, there's a documentary where I don't, like usually with documentaries, there's a, a clear cut conclusion for me. And this, I go back and forth and back and forth because Anna seems quirky, but she doesn't seem insane. Her mom's in the documentary and you have a great talking head. You have uh, an expert talking on Anna's behalf. And even the court trial itself, you point out so many things were not admissible in court that would actually help her case. That was so frustrating to even be reminded how the judicial process works in this country. Yeah, I think I think you bring up a, a really important point, which is, I mean, I, I think th there, it, there's almost no reality that we're that 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 um, where we have all of the pieces, right? I think generally, when dealing with especially especially court cases and trials, things are forced into a kind of a binary, right? Of 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 good or bad or guilty or innocent, and um, I think that it's it's I, I, I wanted to make something that was honest about how difficult it is to achieve consensus about reality, especially when it's a person who cannot speak, right? Which is we take for granted as being the most kind of fundamental part of, of how we express truth and, and reality, right? And how we judge somebody. Oh, we, you know, we judge them by the tone that they used when they said this or that in a courtroom, right? Where they, did they seem like they were they were bullshitting or did they seem truthful? We put so much um, weight on, on, on testimony, right? And when that's taken away, the, the ability to achieve consensus becomes incredibly difficult. And I wanted to be just really honest about that because I think that no matter what you decide at the end of the film about facilitated communication, no matter what you decide about some of the clinical aspects of of, of it, which are outlined by one of the uh, clinicians in the film, you know, there there is a, the mystery of what Derek experienced is not a solved mystery, right? And we do not have the tools or the technology to understand exactly what he, he experienced. We can get close and we can make judgments about whether it should have gone this far. We can talk about the ethics of power and how race and, and class and gender came into to everything, but we it's hard to draw final, final conclusions. I wanted to be honest about that reality. I wanted the audience to have their their own minds, you know, activated and sort of energized by those questions um, that I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I believe when you're dealing with something that's that's high stakes in, in any part of, of, of life, it merits intense scrutiny and, and intense thoughtfulness, right? Before drawing conclusions and before um, attacking each other, whatever it is, right? Uh, so I, 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 that's what I wanted to present. I wanted to to bring people on that ride very specifically, be honest. Yeah, you, you did that brilliantly because I don't see a lot of documentaries like this where it does, uh, there's, there felt like there was so much space in this. There was uh, just a feeling that you get while watching it. Uh, and I didn't want it to end, even though I was conflicted so much throughout. When you're researching something like this, uh, 
first off, what goes into researching something like this? Did you have the Neo machine? Did you go through every piece of transcript? Like how much went into the actual research part of this? Yeah. And I I mean, that was part of the early part of the process where I had time to to do that. They, you know, I was not at the trial itself. So I had to read those sort of hundreds of pages of, of trial transcripts, which are fascinating in, in and of themselves. And they sort of send you on a journey of going back and forth with each new witness. Um, and uh, and I read there's there's some significant studies that were done, though all of them I think um, have their problems uh, about about facilitated communication specifically. Um, there were a number of a number of clinical trials which kind of people on both sides of the aisle have issues with. Um, I read all those. There's there's books uh, by Doug Bicklin uh, that are sort of seminal in in the field of. He's the one that brought facilitated communication back to the states with Rosemary Crossley, who who practiced it in Australia for the first time, um, and uh, and I spent um, you know a lot of time uh, calling people around the country who practiced it. You know, I would call people who ran clinics in 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 Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I, I tried uh, to, to get up to Syracuse many, many times, but I think they they had already come under a lot of scrutiny with FC. I think they were nervous about getting any more kind of media heat on it. But I talked to families who used it. I talked to um, a woman who, uh, you know, claims to have been speaking to her, her sister for 30 years using facilitated communication and, and developing a relationship with, with her that way. Um, so I, I, you know, I went to, 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 to personal stories, personal testimonies about it. I talked to, uh, you know, so many experts that were, um, uh, had to do with the case itself. And I realized, you know, it's kind of endless. You could have a hundred people testifying on behalf of either side and you get a number of interesting things and the article has more voices, but they didn't bring me closer to the truth. So I wanted to create something that was more intimate, especially in like an hour and 40 minute documentary where I had just the right amount of people speaking on behalf of, of, of that kind of part of the, of the story and, um, and to then allow the audience to sort of take the, take the reins at the very end. But there was, yeah, there was uh, years of just of, of speaking to people, reading everything I can get my hands on, watching everything. Um, so there was, there was a lot that went into it. Derek is in the documentary. We see him. Um, yeah. Do you have any updates on how Derek is doing now? He, uh, I mean, listen, I saw him. Um, when did I see him last? I saw him. They came to a screening at the Real Abilities Film Festival here in New York. That was a couple months ago. And he... <laughs> You know, after this many years, we we I feel we know each other. Um, I we we sort of I held his hand as we went into the elevator. I helped him downstairs to the screening room. Um, he was full of smiles and love and and good energy, as was his family. Um, so I, I you know I can only conclude that that he's doing well. You know, that was my. Were thing. you? Were you watching his reaction when Anna came on screen for the first time? Oh yeah. Did oh, he yeah. have a, did he have a, re because however you want to put it, if he was in love or if this was somebody that he worked with, there was still a recognition factor. Like where did he like, what was his reaction? Like? You know, I, here, I, I feel like I don't necessarily want to, um, be too specific in how I come. Yeah, yeah. The, the reason is this is just, you know, he, he has, Derek has a lot of involuntary movements, right? A lot of involuntary motor behaviors uh, because of, of his cerebral palsy. And I think that, you know, his family who has spent 40 years with him now, understanding the sort of subtleties of his physical expression, I think they would be in a much better position to kind of talk about where they felt he was having a strong reaction or not. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of movement. I mean, you see it in the movie, you can, you can see it's a very kind of specific, very unique, um, to, to Derek set of behaviors. Right. And so I, yeah. I, I, and we're in a, you know, we're in a dark room and everyone's watching and I, I, I was not sitting next to him. So I don't, I don't want to comment too much about that, but I think his family, if they decide to do interviews someday, I hope they can.
I hope they do. I, I, I really found his fa uh, family fascinating and so strong. And I even loved how, you know, when the brother or the mom would help him up or even sit him down and she'd be like, there's that smile. I know you're at, like, but it is interesting how we put those feelings and emotions on other people, just like in a sense, facilitated communication is that we fill in certain blanks for these people like Derek. And I sometimes wonder, uh, you know, facilitated, facilitated communication for them. There's no way that family would ever try that again for Derek. Did you no. get that sense? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. what I figured as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's over. Yeah. I think, um, the, the next kind of steps for somebody like Derek is I, my personal belief going to evolve with technology, right? I think that like we're at the beginning of, of all kinds of technology that may get us closer to, to the very specific experiences of, of, of somebody like Derek. I mean, listen, you know, his brother says um, one of the, one of the um, biggest motivators for, for uh, ask because he came to Anna and asked if she would work with with his brother uh, Derek. Right? It was it was John who who came to her, and yeah. one, of the, one of the biggest motivators he said was because he wanted to know when his brother was in pain. He wanted to know when his brother needed hospital care as opposed to just Tylenol. Right? He wanted to know how how to what degree do you is this an emergency? Th those things that kind of as a family member who is is doing their best to try and 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 ascertain you know what's going on it, it, those are the, those were the big motivating uh reasons why he went to her he wanted to help his brother to help protect yeah him, you know it wasn't like he wanted to know his opinions on foucault or like any kind of like you know theory yeah. and Correct. um maybe down the down the road i think i'm sure he he was i think at one point he says in the film you know he was excited about you know he was he was a black scholar his baby brother was going to be a black scholar he there was moments of excitement about that but i think that um yeah fundamentally initially it's just about how how can i how do i get more tools so that i can i can protect and help my brother you know and those tools wow. are still being invented as well as my point you know and finally, as we wind down here, uh, the one of the reasons why I jumped at this uh, to watch in the first place was I saw uh, Louis Thoreau's name attached to it, who I have a great deal of respect, and I've always uh, so enjoyed his work. And this is actually done through his company, Mindhouse. He's an executive producer on this. What do you think drew Louis to this project and your work in the first place? Um, I mean, Louis, we had talked really early on about it because he, he actually was... Um, pursuing the story and then found out that I had already been on it for a couple of years. So he, he sort of, we, uh, we, we, we began speaking and I think it was, it's just a story that's kind of, you know, right up his alley. I think that he is an incredibly um, curious person. And I think the thing that we share in common is, is we, um, we're not quick to judge situations, even when they're extreme, right? I think he's attracted to extreme stories, and I think he has the kind of ability to um, to walk in with a, in his case, in his case, with a with a dry demeanor and just sort of seek truth and reactions and probing. And I, I, I feel um, a real kind of affinity for, for that, you know, and, and, and so I think he and I just were, we had sort of equal amounts of curiosity and fascination with the subject and all the questions that it, that it, that it brought up. And so it was a very natural fit uh, with Mindhouse. So the yeah. collaboration was exciting in the sense that it was a really good back and forth, like made you potentially think about avenues that you might not have thought about yourself at first? Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, it's not always the case where you 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 send cuts to your sort of executives and and get inspired by by new you know kind of ideas and like new. But he and 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 Sky to be, you know frankly and and Aaron um, uh, at Mindhouse, um, Aaron Fellows, everyone sort of wanted to push this film as far as we could we could take it, and we were all on board together with this idea of having, I don't want to say an ambiguous ending, but something that is not wholly conclusive with a fine, you know, period at the end. Um, so that once you share a vision like that, it's kind of like it unlocks the, 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 the sort of process in a way that is so wonderful. And that, that is what happened here. You know, I think we shared that vision and it un unlocked the ability to be, to take risks and to, to go down rabbit holes and to come back with a better story. And, um, yeah, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Well, and finally, since this is out on Netflix right now, by the time you're watching or listening to this, folks, 
When you start this project initially, do you ever have the audience in mind in the end? And now that this is finished, what do you hope that we take away from this viewing experience? Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, I think it's always that question of like, you don't want to um, cater to, you don't, you don't want to do it so that, so that everyone likes you, right? You don't want to like make the film that everyone's just going to uh, applaud you for. But you also, I, I believe in having respect for the audience, right? And I, 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 I believe audiences are incredibly, incredibly smart, like sometimes smarter than, 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 you know, some networks even give them credit for. I think they can, <laughs> you know, incredibly uh, complicated stories. I think they can decipher. I mean, people are so fluent in documentary now. It's not like 15, 20 years ago where it was like you had five documentaries a year that people had seen. It was like wing, wing migration and a few others, right, that people remember. <laughs> you know, now it's like people... They understand the form. They they expect it to get to get pushed. They expect the storytelling of documentary to to get pushed in new directions. Um, and I think that that it, we're, they're at their most sort of open uh, minded to 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 uh, how to experience films like this. And so um, I have a great amount of respect for the audience. And I think I hope I gave them something that they that they can think about and talk about and argue with, uh, you know, at, at at holiday dinners or the dinner afterwards, you know, and 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 inspire each other through conversation i want people to talk and 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 yeah talk about it more than anything I, I you did i was arguing with my girlfriend after we watched it i mean we were going back and forth i was like this is i mean and i'm so excited for you guys at home to watch this we want to make sure this doesn't get lost in the shuffle because this is just fantastic i wish i could watch this again for the first time it really came out of left field for me the documentary once again is called tell them you love me it is on netflix right now it is sometimes, it's an all sort of like feeling documentary. You're going to sit with your uncomfortableness. You're going to have some laughter. You're going to have a romance. You're going to have a mystery. It is all in this. And it also gives space because I think, uh, you know, Nick, you're just a fantastic documentarian. Are you allowed to tease what you might be working on next? Is there something fascinating in your head that you can't get rid of? Uh, I, I don't want to say too much specifics, but I've, I'm working on about three things. One's a very, very personal story of a gentleman who's on death row. Uh, another one is in the true crime wheelhouse, but it sort of verges into, I don't want to say social justice, but there's there's a, a, a sort of a very, that's at the sort of root of it. Um, I'm also, as a I'm going to confess I'm a horror film fan, and so I'm also doing some writing. <laughs> Hell yeah, I love that. <laughs> Um, so I've got, I'm working on a lot. Yeah. At the moment, I feel very inspired and, and riding this wave is, has been amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm very thankful to talk to you and you have a fan for life and me now I will be following your career at this point. Uh, thank you for spending so much time with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, tell them you love me, Nick August Perna. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was great. Real pleasure. Thank you.